Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com. In order to understand science, you have to have an open mind and you have to adhere to basic principles. One of the most fundamental principles of science is the ideal gas law. This is a law which was developed in three parts going back hundreds of years. In 1662, Robert Boyle demonstrated a relationship between pressure and volume of gases. In a closed system, in order to increase the pressure, you have to decrease the volume. We're all familiar with this because this is how a bicycle pump works. When you press down on the pump, the pressure increases in the system. Then in 1787, Charles Law was introduced. It basically states that if the temperature of a gas increases, the volume of that gas increases as well, and vice versa. If the temperature goes down, the volume decreases as well. This is why hot air balloons work better in the wintertime than they do in the summer. During the winter, when the outside air temperature is lower, the volume of the air also decreases. This makes the outside air more dense, and thus the balloon becomes more buoyant. Then in 1811, the third part of the ideal gas law was introduced. It basically stated that if you add more gas molecules, you expand the volume, and vice versa. This law is intuitively obvious. If you increase the number of molecules, they're going to take up more space. When we put those three laws together, we get the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume equals the number of molecules times a constant times the temperature. The ideal gas law allows us to calculate the temperature of a gas if we know the pressure, volume, and number of molecules. It doesn't make any difference what the gas is, whether it's oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, or anything else. It doesn't matter if you call it a greenhouse gas. It still has to abide by this law. This is the point of the discussion where people need to clear out their minds of their pet theories about greenhouse gases. Whatever theories you come up with about carbon dioxide and methane, they have to abide by the ideal gas law. Let's think about what happens when you pump up a bicycle tire. When you push down on the handle, you decrease the volume and thus increase the pressure. You also increase the temperature of the system because you're doing work to it by pushing down on the handle. A bicycle pump can get quite hot, but when you stop pumping, everything cools down quickly. After you disconnect the bicycle pump, the tire pressure is controlled by the temperature outside of the tire. On a cold day, the tire pressure will go down, and on a hot day, the tire pressure will increase. All of these behaviors are explained by the ideal gas law. For centuries, people understood and abided by these laws. But then Carl Sagan came along with his runaway greenhouse effect theory about Venus. And Stephen Hawking extended this to Earth is going to burn up. But the warmth on Venus is fully explained by the ideal gas law. Venus has a very thick atmosphere and thus the surface pressure on Venus is extremely high. This is due to the weight of the gases above it. The volume of Venus's atmosphere doesn't change, and the number of molecules doesn't change either. So high pressure on Venus necessarily means high temperature. This is a concept which most people are familiar with. If you hike down the Grand Canyon, the temperature at the bottom is much hotter than the temperature at the top. This is because when you're at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, there's more air above you, and thus the pressure is higher, which means the temperature has to be higher as well. In 1981, I was working as a wilderness ranger on top of Sandia Peak outside of Albuquerque. The top of the mountain is about a mile higher than the city. There's a tramway going up from the city to the top of the mountain. Frequently, it was very hot when I'd get on in the city, 
and when I got to the top of the mountain, it was often very cool. This is for the same reason. The atmospheric pressure is much lower at the top of the mountain than it is at the bottom, and thus the temperature is much lower as well. On June 27th, 1981, I was working at a location on the top of the mountain where hang glider pilots like to take off from. There were thunderstorms building up and a couple of pilots were preparing to take off. We tried to convince them not to launch, but they did, and one of them turned into a giant hailstone. Bob Abbott was an experienced hang glider pilot, but he got taken up to 40,000 feet and was found in a drift of ice about 10 miles away. He found out the hard way that the ideal gas law was very real. But the focus of this video is Venus, not Albuquerque. This picture doesn't look much like Venus, but it's the best I could get ChatGPT to do. Venus is always radiating away long-wave energy into space and absorbing short-wave energy from the Sun. This keeps the atmosphere of Venus at steady-state equilibrium. The amount of energy flowing out of Venus's atmosphere is equal to the amount being absorbed from the Sun. The temperature profile of Venus's troposphere is very predictable based on the ideal gas law. Temperatures high up in Venus's troposphere are quite cool, but as you descend through the troposphere it gets hotter and hotter, and at the surface it's extremely hot. This goes back to the ideal gas law. As you descend through Venus's troposphere, the pressure increases and thus the temperature increases as well. Because of the very high pressure, we can predict that the temperature on the surface of Venus is also extremely hot, and it is. There is nothing in this equation which relates to greenhouse gases. It's the same for all different types of chemical compositions. So let's go back to Earth now and do a thought experiment. Suppose the Grand Canyon were twice as deep as it is now. You can probably guess that the temperature at the bottom would be much higher. This is because there would be more weight of air above it, thus higher pressures and higher temperatures. If Earth's atmosphere were as thick as Venus's atmosphere is, we would have temperatures comparably hot to Venus. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels on Venus are about 250,000 times higher than they are on Earth. Yet at the same pressure in Venus' troposphere, temperatures are not much different from Earth. In other words, the greenhouse effect is not responsible for the high temperatures on Venus. Carl Sagan had no clue what he was talking about. Venus is not hot because of a runaway greenhouse effect. Venus is hot because it has a very thick troposphere. He should have stuck to basic principles. And even more so for Stephen Hawking. He took the runaway greenhouse idea to even more ridiculous levels. We need real scientists once again who understand that whatever their theory is, it has to abide by basic principles. Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Toto's been pulling back the curtain on the science deniers in academia for more than 16 years. You can visit him and his family on the web at realclimatescience.com.